limit rules, like the limit of a sum equals the sum of the limits, seem very plausible. So why bother about the formal proofs if you are not a mathematician? Well, you see that those proofs are in the textbooks you are using. Also, if those textbooks are aimed at an engineering audience. So apparently they are interesting for non-mathematicians as well. But why is this? A uh, reason for this is that mathematics is not only used as a tool to compute stuff, but also as a language in which, for example, physics is written. This means that when you are studying math, you do not only learn how to compute, but also how to formulate and write. It takes some time to learn the level of precision required to formulate properly in mathematics, and that is where these relatively easy examples come in. To get used to the language using, say, relatively innocent problems. So let's take a look at our limit rules. Rule zero: f uh, x uh, limit x to a f x equals l. Then, if you multiply f by a constant, then limit x to a of c times f equals c times l. Seems plausible, but how do we prove it? Well, what does this? first statement means, so what is given? Well, we are given that for any epsilon 1 bigger than 0, I can get l of x as close to l as I like, so I can get f x minus l smaller than this epsilon 1, provided I take x small enough, so it's small, close enough to a. So that is what is given. So what do we want to prove? Well, uh, that I can get c times f arbitrarily close to c times l. So for every epsilon bigger than zero, for any usually very small number of epsilon, I can find a delta such that provided I take x close enough to a, so x minus smaller than delta, my c times f minus c times l smaller than this epsilon. So that's what we need to prove. So look at the general structure. First you always put given something, and then it's good to uh, put what do I actually need to prove. So that's uh, usually a good start for any proof. So how are we going to prove this? Well, we use the following trick. Uh, we know that the norm of c times f minus c times l. We want to show that this we can get this very small. Well, we can take the c out, so put this absolute value of c in front, and then we notice that this, uh, this whole, all of this is trivial for c equals zero, because then my c times f will be everywhere zero and the limit will be zero, so that is fine. So now we wonder what happens if c is not equal to zero. Well, in that case, given any epsilon bigger than zero and uh, c not equal to zero, I set, I define my epsilon one as epsilon divided by the norm of c. And then I know, because I'm given that, I can find the delta one, such that if x minus a is in norm is smaller than delta one, that my f of x minus l is smaller than this epsilon one, which I've chosen to be epsilon over norm of c. So why did we choose this old uh, epsilon one? Well, I know I can choose any epsilon one, so in particular I can choose epsilon over the norm of c. Well, Look what happens if I choose delta to be equal to delta 1. Then I know c times f minus c times l in norm uh, equals the c times f of x minus l. And I know that it is smaller than c times epsilon over c, because we chose epsilon 1 to be epsilon over c. So we see that the c's cancel out. So we see that my c times f minus c times l will be in norm smaller than epsilon, provided we choose our uh, delta equals delta 1. And then we've shown that we can get c times f arbitrarily close to c times l. Well, you see, the, the trick in this proof here lies over here in the choice of this epsilon 1. Well, how do you find such an uh, 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 epsilon 1? Well, this requires some a fiddling around and some trial and error and to get used to this. So let's do a second example, which goes similarly, this sum rule. Well, given that uh, 
F converges to L1 and G converges to L2. And then we have to show that the sum rule holds that the sum of F of G converges to L1 plus L2. So what do we have given now? F goes to L1 if X approaches A. So that means that I can get F minus L arbitrarily close uh, to zero. So F minus L norm can be, I can get a smaller than NA epsilon one provided X is, small, uh, is close enough to A. And that's also given that G converges to L2, which means that a uh, norm of G minus L becomes arbitrarily small uh, provided I choose X close enough to A. And those delta 1 and delta 2 do not need to be the same values. Uh, they are two separate limits. So that's what is given. So I know that that is true. What do we need to prove? Well, to prove I need I, to, uh, show that I, I should need to show that I get F plus G arbitrarily close to L1 plus 2. So we have to show that norm of F plus G minus L1 plus L2 can be made arbitrarily small, arbitrarily small smaller than any epsilon, provided we choose X close enough to A. So how are we going to do that? Well, first we look at this quantity over here. Now we see we take the norm of F plus G minus L1 plus L2. Then we have an F minus L1 over here and a G minus L2 over there. And I know that those separate parts will be small, but how can I separate them? They are now inside absolute value. Fortunately, we know the triangle equality norm of A plus B is smaller or equal than the norm of A plus the norm of B. So that's what we are doing over here. Uh, <coughs> And then I know that I get, can get these two parts here small. So how do, we, how do we proceed? Now we have to, given our epsilon bigger than zero, we have to pick a smart epsilon one and a smart epsilon two. So what do we do? We pick epsilon one and epsilon two both equal to epsilon over two. Then I know that I can get uh, f minus l one smaller than epsilon one, provided I pick x minus a smaller than some delta one. I know that I can get g minus l2 smaller than epsilon two, provided I pick x minus a smaller than delta two. So I can get f minus l1 smaller than epsilon over two, and I can get g minus l2 smaller than epsilon over two as well, provided I take x minus a in norm smaller than delta one and smaller than delta two. So how do we take the uh, choose delta? Well, we take the minimum of the two of the two deltas, because uh, if I take the minimum of the two deltas, well, suppose it is delta one, then I know that my x minus a is smaller than delta one in norm, but uh, the delta two is bigger, so uh, that means that uh, if my x minus a is smaller than delta one, it's certainly smaller than the bigger delta two. So I know that both of them hold. So I know that. Um, F, uh, uh, the, this term over here, the f minus l1 is smaller than epsilon 1 equals epsilon over 2. This term is also smaller than epsilon over 2, so the sum of the two is smaller than epsilon, which means that we can so get the sum f plus g smaller than epsilon close to l1 plus l2, uh, which proves the sum rule.